All right, welcome back. Now, the loss of life on our roads has been an unsettling trend in the first quarter of the year. The National Transport and Safety Authority, or NTSA, has said over 1,200 lives were lost in road accidents in the first three months of this year. Now, in response to this, the authority has launched operations countrywide by increasing safety measures to tackle the road menace. But are such interventions effective? And what will it really take to restore sanity on our roads? Joining me in studio are Bright Oiwaya, a road safety advocate and executive director of the Association for Safe International Road Travel, or Asit Kenya, uh, an NGO that promotes uh, road safety, as well as Kevin Ismail, communications coordinator for the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety. Thank you both for joining me. Um, Kevin, let me start with you, because this is something that your organization has been tracking. When it comes to the causes for our viewers to really understand why are we seeing such a high number of accidents and, and what's the main cause on Kenyan roads? Uh, thanks, Vicky, for having us. I mean, uh, our Kenyan roads have become quite dangerous in recent years, and I think it's been a worrying trend that we have had in, in, in recent years, and even this year, as we have seen from the Kenya, I mean, from the National Transport and Safety Authority. We have lost 1,200 people for the last, actually, three months. And you would ask yourself, what is causing these road crashes on the road? And one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest worrying uh, trend is the issue of speeding. Um, the issue of speeding, the issue of drunk driving, there's also the aspect of um, how are people on the road, especially the drivers? Are we mindful? Are we, are, we driving our, are, we, are we driving our cars when we are at the right mental state? So those are some of the causes of road crashes on, on our roads today, and it's something that actually needs to be looked at. Bright, let me bring you in here, because um, you actually are a victim of a road crash. Um, 1997, it was a head-on collision. Your life literally was turned upside down. You know, take us through that moment and, and how life has completely shifted since. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me first and foremost. And um, I also just wanted to add that I'm currently consulting for the Global Road Safety Partnership. And yes, I am a survivor of a road crash that happened uh, 26 years ago. It's going to be 27 years in October this year. And the one thing that you know is that life is never the same. You're one day uh, do, uh, walking around, doing your thing, having your plan, and all of a sudden you have a verdict. You can't walk. And you join statistics of those that are crash victims and those are people with disability. It's a whole a new dynamic and you have to adjust so many things. It's the physical, it's the psychological, it's the social, it's the economic. It's very expensive to have a disability in this country. One, accessibility is a problem. Two, uh, missed opportunities because of that lack of accessibility. Even the roads themselves, the, the thing, the, the roads and the vehicles, you are a victim at the, on the road and with the vehicles, but after the crash again, they subject you to difficulty because now you can't share the road with them because many times the infrastructure is not very supporting for people in wheelchairs and people that are walking and even people that are cycling. So it's, it's a whole new thing that happens to you. And it's quite devastating, not just to the individual, but it affects the entire family. No, absolutely. You've just painted a picture of the social impact it has and how disruptive a road crash can be. Kevin, let me bring you in here, because when you look at the figures, which demographic is most likely to be involved in a road crash and how are you engaging them? Yeah. So if you look at the World Health Organization report, uh, we see over one million people lose lives every year. And out of this, this one million that are losing lives, and then there are 50 million people that are getting injuries, some of them very serious injuries. And if you look at from, this, uh, from these numbers that you're having, we have people between the age of 5 to 29. So this is the demographic of young people. They are mostly the people that we are losing into road crashes. They are people that their lives change drastically. And, 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 and I mean, 
it, it changes even the aspect of how the economy is run because most of these population are the active people and the people that are supposed to contribute to the economy. So when you find someone that has his or has her life has been has been changed completely because of a road crash, then it becomes how it, it affects different angles of I mean of how we live or even how they live in their own personal lives. You know, uh, Bright, we're entering the second, or rather we're in the second UN decade for action um, against road safety, or well, for road safety, I beg your pardon. And, and the goal is to have road deaths by 2030. It's a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. And I know you're heavy on advocacy in that space. How realistic is that goal? Mm -hmm. The goal could be realistic. Actually, from the last decade of action to this current decade of action, uh, data by WHO shows that there's some countries that actually reduced, meet, met that target of reducing uh, road crashes by, road deaths by 50%. Mm -hmm. So it means that it is possible. While generally, globally, uh, road crashes and road, road fatalities uh, it reduced by about 5%, 5.3%, unfortunately, Kenya increased from 23 for every 100,000 population in the last uh, set Global Status Report to 28 for every 100,000 people in, in the current status report that was launched in December. So we need to have a paradigm shift. Yeah. We have been quick to blame. When a road crash happens, we've been quick to blame. But we fail to understand that road crashes work in a system. Transport is a transport system. And failure in one area of the system causes there to be failure in the total system. So we are talking about the roads themselves. We are talking about the vehicle safety. We are talking about the behavioral risk factors, which uh, Kevin mentioned some of them, the drink driving, the speed, the lack of wearing of seat belts, the lack of child restraints, although that's still not in our law, the seat belt wearing itself. So all those are behavioral risk factors. But it is easy to say that People are reckless, drivers are reckless, and there's truth in that. Yeah. But sometimes you need much more than just focusing on the blame, who was, on, who was to blame. Look at the entire system. You can treat an infrastructural, have an infrastructural treatment that causes behavior to change. So you don't necessarily, it is not always possible that you stand in a podium and you'll say, we need to be drive safely, and that's what I hear again and again. What is that? What will motivate people to do that? Sometimes other interventions coupled by awareness, coupled by enforcement, coupled by what I said, the vehicle safety and the infrastructural adjustments uh, work together in a system which we call the safe systems approach. And that's a paradigm we need to move to, other than blaming, other than having knee-jerk reactions. I mean, it's clear that one can't work without the other, right, as we've just described, is this whole ecosystem of interventions. And I want to kind of zero in into one, which was Alcoblow. It was a popular intervention. It was a spectacle on the media, you know, in terms of drunk drivers being held on the street and asked to kind of, you know, say whether they were drinking on their way home and whatnot. But did you see a behavior change? And I'll take this to Kevin. Did you see a behavior change with something like Alcoblow? I mean, it's one of the interventions, and I think uh, for some time it worked, uh, just that perhaps maybe the implementation of that particular uh, intervention was probably not very sustainable, and perhaps that's why it stopped or people did not take it very seriously. But I will say that there are many ways on which we can be able to influence behavioral change. And I think even as an initiative, what we've been trying to do is to really bring in all the stakeholders together and try to build capacity when it comes to enforcement. How are we enforcing in terms of um, uh, data? We need to be able to have the right data for us to be able to also define the kind of approaches or the kind of interventions that we need to have. From the communication aspect, we are also working as an initiative to build capacity even within the media. How are we reporting on matters road safety? I mean, we need to play an equal role and in, in ensuring that we are sensitized and empower the public with the information and people understanding that actually road crashes is a public health issue. There are so many people dying on the road. There are so many effects that it has on, on, on the economy, on people's life, livelihoods. And if we are able to be able to come together from the media, from the government, from the I mean, private sector, for us to be able to work together in ensuring that some of these things, as, as Bright has mentioned, we are able to collaboratively work together and have even goodwill from the government, which is also very critical when it comes to, um, I mean, uh, trying to enhance road safety and changing behavior in, within, within our country and on our roads. 
Right. You know, Bright, uh, let me bring you in here because Kevin mentioned something, which was how we report on road crashes. Is that a problem at times? Because, you know, we as the media will report on it as an event. Mm -hmm. The pictures mm -hmm. are very jarring. You know, they'll shock people and then we'll pass on to something else the next day. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel this message for road safety is not hitting home as it should? Yeah, rightfully, Victoria, just like you said, we like absolute figures. We like to say 24 people, 30 people died in that crash, and that's it. What we forget that for every fatality is a family, is a brother, is an uncle, is a breadwinner. So there's a lot more. Uh, look at the economics. Somebody, for example, Buddha Buddha rider, dies in a road crash, was a breadwinner, or is injured to a point that they have to be admitted to a hospital. The bills pile up. The next of kin can't, can't take care of that. So you immediately get into that uh, a poverty uh, uh, space because um, one incident has a lot of has spiral, a spiral effect. So it is important to also look at data. Uh, Right now, the data we get and the data we report is the data that we get from police and NTSA, which is the same data principally. But how about the data of those that get injured and are taken into hospital and maybe die later? So we, we don't have a way of having combining that data on people who had hit and run and sorted the problem on the road. So we don't have accurate data. And we don't, you, when you don't have accurate data, when you don't base your inter interventions on, on evidence and on data, then it's like having malaria and treating a stomach problem. You will never get to heal. So we need to stop. We need to analyze the data that we have. We need to target intervention. And we also need to report holistically, not, not emotionally, not not, not a one, uh, looking at one aspect of, of like I said, it's a system. Right. Once you understand it's a system, you want to know what are the contributing factors. You want to know what are the interventions there for. You want to know what is best practice, what has worked. Because there's science out there that tells us what, has, uh, what works and what doesn't work. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So we don't need to be on panic mode. We just need to stop to relook, rethink, use data, use evidence, and put in the interventions. Kevin, you've just heard Bright talk about some of the challenges, especially when it comes yeah. to data um, and making sense of the numbers, if you will, so it actually has the impact. But what is your organization doing, uh, the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative, in that regard? Yeah, so as an initiative, we are supporting the government and specifically working with the county government of Mombasa mm -hmm. in building capacity when it comes to matters enforcement. And on data, we have actually a whole surveillance a team that works on developing, I mean, collecting data and developing reports that will guide in terms of what are the, some of the action plans that we need to come up with, what are some of the interventions that we need to come up with, interventions and action plans that are actually informed by data. And if, uh, for example, you'd ask me earlier, who, which, is the, which is the demographic? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you also look at what are the most days that actually people, you find road crashes on the road. And even from the report that we actually uh, released last year, which was the first of its kind for the city of Mombasa, we realized that uh, a lot of road crashes happen between Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so you, you try to ask yourself, the demographics are the most, mostly young people yeah. or even private cars, the SUVs. So what are some of the trends? What is causing all this? So in terms of how the Bloomberg Initiative is working is that we are bringing in the stakeholders working with the National Transport and Safety Authority and the, and the county government of Mombasa. And we are also looking into cascading or rather moving into the national level and, and just being able to provide that support in ensuring that we have the right data, which informs us now in terms of the decisions we make and in terms of the interventions that we're actually making to ensure that we, re we reduce or zero down on matters road crashes on our roads. No, absolutely. And right, let me finish with you because uh, there's a tweet here from one of the viewers, Engineer Lazaro, who says a good number of vehicles on our roads are unroadworthy, then corruption in law enforcement agencies, plus behavior of drunk drivers, um, overdrugged border border riders are the main cause of rising road carnage in the nation. So it's not just one thing. You know, yes, we've talked about speed. Yes, we've talked about young people. But if you were to send this message out, you know, and kind of give this sense of urgency to those watching, what would you say as their takeaway when it comes to road safety? First and foremost, I'll keep insisting that we must begin to look at this whole thing in the context of a system. 
And when it's a system, you have to rally all stakeholders together. As we have rightfully discussed and, and, and agreed here, is that no one person is able to accomplish this, this task. Mm -hmm. So what rallies people together is a strategy. And we need a strategy, a national strategy, that is able to then inform what are the areas, where are the risk factors, and what then are the interventions. So it is very important for us to come out of this one thing, quick fix solution. Road safety takes time. Road safety needs funding. Road safety needs it's scientific. Road safety needs, it, it, it's, it's consistent. So if you lack consistency, if you lack resources, if you lack um, analysis of the data, then you will do a lot of things. It's just like running around a room, you'll be tired, but you'll not have succeeded in any way. So we need to focus. We need to settle down, we need to focus. We need to rally stakeholders together. And we need them to look at all the aspects, analyze the data. When we say it is pedestrians that are number one in terms of the segmentations of the, the, the people that are, are, are killed, then we need to ask why are pedestrians being killed and where are they, they being killed? So they are, therefore, what can we do? We hear it's pedestrians that is high, then we rush to do something with Boda Bodas or something, because Boda Bodas are the second anyway, so they rank highly. So let's focus on what is the issue. And that way we will begin to see some changes. Oh, certainly you've just said it. Hopefully we begin to see some changes. Thank you so much, Bright and Kevin, for coming in and raising more awareness on this very important issue of road safety. It certainly affects all of us uh, in this country, so this conversation must not just stop here. Let's take a short break here on Citizen Weekend. Much more ahead. Stay with us.